So uh, who here has ever had a real-time clock fail on their laptop 26 minutes before their talk started at DEF CON? <laughs> Just me then. <laughs> All right. Great. So uh, this is my first time at DEF CON, and I am going to learn to back up my slides from now on. Um, <laughs> Hey, let's do a talk. Uh, do you have the button? No? I'll just stand here. It's cool. My name is Rick Farina. Uh, nobody here knows who that is. I'm also Zero Chaos. I do a little bit of work on the Aircrack team. But the fact of the matter is, is uh, this fantastic gentleman right here is Mr. X. So anybody here ever crack a web key? And somebody give this man a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so as I said, this is Thomas Dio Trepp, founder of Aircrack NG. My name's Rick Farina. I just kind of hang out and goof off and come up with some funny stuff. So we've, we've got a little bit of stuff we'd like to talk to you about today, a little bit of Aircrack NG stuff. And then we've also done a little bit of our own uh, research individually and just some, uh, some random fun places of the world. So we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, some of the topics in this presentation may be used to break the law in new and exciting ways. Of course, we don't recommend breaking the law, and it is your responsibility to check your local laws, blah, 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 blah. No, in all seriousness, folks, um, part of this talk is definitely something that will get you arrested by the feds if you do something wrong. So I will highlight that, and I will warmly recommend that you don't do it. Um, my code release was also on the laptop that exploded, so I will totally have that out later today, I promise. Um, again, my laptop exploded, so my little AP contest is going to be postponed till tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow in the Wi-Fi village, I'm going to put up an access point. All you have to do is tell me what frequency it's on and what its MAC address is. That's it. Anybody here think they can do that? All right. So if you can do it, first hour of it, oh, I'll give it like two hours maybe. I'll buy you a Ubiquiti SRC card. All you have to do is tell me what frequency and my MAC address. If it takes you too long, maybe I'll give you 50 bucks towards a nice Atheros card. And if it takes all day, then I'll give you a hearty handshake and a pat on the back for finally downloading my patch and figuring out what I did. Okay? I'm going to turn it over to Thomas here. We're going to talk a little bit about some new stuff we've done in Aircrack, and hopefully you guys will think it's funny. So for web attacks, uh, yeah. okay. uh, for web attacks, you can... Uh, sniff passively, but it's it's uh, slow. Uh, you have to wait a long time to get enough packets to create. Uh, and now there's no more weak IV, uh, but you can use replay. Uh, unfortunately, replaying uh, is a bit noisy. You can easily uh, find a signature. For example, on our replay, you can see on the host just open a TCP dump on the interface, and you will see a lot of ARP. Uh, there's also uh, some features on access points that can prevent uh, getting IVs. Uh, about WP WPA, uh, for pre-shared key, you, you need to get both sides of the communication and does you need to be in range of both the client and the access point. And for enterprises, it's nearly impossible to crack it passively, but um, most cases of EAP are not easy to man into middle. Uh, currently, nearly all attacks uh, focus on the access points, uh, but access points are getting more and more secure. There's new features in it, uh, PSPF, uh, client isolation. Uh, you can see strong authentication. Um, and now the, the APs are no longer the unguarded backdoor. Uh, we're going to attack the clients. Uh, tools uh, appeared recently, but they're not easy to use, and there, there are F odd requirements. Uh, here's a few tools, WebAuth, Cafe Latte, Heart Attack. It's a new attack we developed that turns any uh, IP packet into a uh, hard packet. Uh, for WPA, there's no public implementation. Uh, 
for PSK and for Enterprise, uh, we have a free radius WPE, thanks to Brad and Josh, but it still requires a uh, hardware access point. Uh, to attack the client, there's many separate tools that are not easy to use, uh, and the documentation is not always there, and the configuration is uh, not easy until now. Where we developed Airbase NG, it's a full moni monitor mode access point. Uh, it merges few tools into one, and it also works in ad hoc mode. Um, it's easy and it's fast and deadly for keys. Uh, there's a few abilities of Airbase NG. You can do the evil twin, uh, do a fake access point that looks like the access point of your company, Onipot or Karma. Uh, it implements web attack, hurt attack, uh, cafe latte. Uh, you can also get the handshake with, without having the access point. You only need the client, and there will be will soon uh, will soon see WP Enterprise attacks. Our uh, base NG is a soft AP. Uh, you can use web on it uh, with open or shared key, uh, cafe latte attack, and here attack as I said. You can capture WP access points, can manipulate packets, even decrypt web packets and resend them. Uh, you can also filter, add some filters to avoid disturbing uh, nearby networks, and some of the filters are on the BSSID, and you can also use uh, ESSID, because by default it catches everything any client probing for, for a network will be attached to Airbase. It also implements uh, MAC filtering like you can see on your access points. Here's a few examples. You can uh, easily capture the WPN shake. Uh, the access point will be called my AP. Uh, you can also develop scripts to Manipulate packets. Uh, you have to use dash y uppercase and then start another script in another console. Uh, this replay script, this script is given in every archive of Airquake NG. You can find it in the test directory. You can also do a soft access point, meaning that it's, it looks like a real one. You can connect to the access point. Uh, you can ping the computers to SSH. You can even connect to internet via this computer. So, uh, Rick, we'll continue. So Airbase uh, NG is kind of a, a combination of a bunch of projects that the guys in the aircraft team have been having for for years now, setting up multiple access points, trying to crack everything in sight and. I, I had a friend of mine that was just uh, using a little Airbase NG, and in this track, I believe it was just the other day, cracked about three or four cell phones with it. Um, it it's a really fun tool, and really all, all the access point security is there these days. It's getting a lot better. Anything especially deployed recently is going to be pr pretty tight. But now the clients are a lot more fun. So we, we talk about just attacking the clients directly, but the fact is, is this doesn't promise a win either. This just makes it a lot easier. When access points first started out, nobody was really looking there. Nobody thought of the security. Now it's the clients that are shifting, uh, shifting the focus towards the clients now. So there are actually ways to defend this. APs are being configured more securely. The clients need to as well. So the simple defenses are actually covered really well on uh, Josh Wright's website, Will Hack for Sushi. Uh, I'll have a full list of stuff at the end of this. But uh, th there's a lot of really important things you can do. I warmly recommend you check it out. There's actually group policy objects for those of you poor people that have to administer Windows boxes. And I'm guessing it's most of the audience. There's actually a very, very great way to set up some of these things. It's very well covered by Josh. So I'm telling you the bad things. And, and I tell you that the, the defenses are there. You just have to look for them. So as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, personal projects now. So we, we were working on the Airbase stuff for a while, and 
I don't know, I get bored really easily. So I like Atheros cards. Who else likes Atheros? Anybody? A couple of people like Atheros. They're really nice. They're called software-defined radios. And I was going through the frequency set, and I saw, you know, okay, okay here's the U.S. frequency set. That looks a little weird. I mean, is the card really not capable of transmitting on those frequencies in the middle? I mean, seriously? It's missing 400 megahertz out of the middle of the spectrum? What about the licensed bands? Who here has a Ubiquiti Super Range card bus? It's a fantastic card. I just blew one of them up yesterday. Uh, really nice. Um, if you go to Ubiquiti's website and several other manufacturers as well, they also have licensed radios. Sell things for military usage, public safety, all kinds of really interesting applications. Very, very expensive stuff. And it operates on 4.920 gigahertz. 4.9, 5.1. They really tripled the cost of the radio and made a different one? I wonder if we can do that without making an extra radio. So it turns out that as a software-defined radio, Atheros actually does do most of that fun stuff in the software. So what do we do? Unfortunately, as you all know, Atheros is uh, very nervous about people doing things like, I don't know, changing the frequency set that the card supports. So they release a binary-only how for mad Wi-Fi. Works pretty well unless you want to do hacking stuff. But nobody here likes closed-source binaries, do you? Okay, so Ath5K was actually released by the community. It was approved by Atheros as acceptable. Nobody got sued over it. It was really great. And so here we are with a driver that almost works that you can do whatever you want with. So let's take a look. Okay, if it's driven by a binary HAL and Ath5K is the new stuff, let's take a look at Ath5K. So on the Mad Wi-Fi mailing list not too long ago, a gentleman by the name of uh, Kugutsuman apologize if I mispronounce your name. If you're here, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, he released a patch to do the debug regulatory domain. Basically, it allows all of the channels that Atheros officially supports according to their own testing. Well, there are some really entertaining comments in the Ath5K code. and Set this to one to disable regulatory domain restrictions. <laughs> oh, you thought that one was funny. What about this one? The transceiver supports frequencies from 4.920 to 6100 and from 2312 to 2732. Wow, <laughs> that's kind of funny. Hey, what's that down at the bottom of Japan? 4.8 gigahertz. Isn't that reserved for the DOD in this country? Huh. <laughs> so yesterday, <laughs> your card could support 2412 to 2462, 5180, 5320. 5745, 5825. My driver kind of supports about 600 channels. <laughs> so when you set the debug regulatory domain, you can now go from 2.192 gigahertz to 2.732 on the BG, and uh, 4800 to 6000. Um, we'll, we'll talk about what that means in uh, just a second. You'll notice I only go up to 6000. You'll also notice I mentioned I turned a really nice Wi Fi card into a brick. So the, the gentleman upstairs at the Hardware Hacking Village actually have a really nice spectrum analyzer. When I started transmitting on 6.1 gigahertz, the uh, card stopped transmitting. It still listens very well, but the preamp doesn't seem to work very hot anymore. <laughs> so what's on these new frequencies? This is why I mentioned you will very much get in trouble. Okay, We have your fixed point-to-point, -point, DOD. Some amateur radio guys here. Amateur radio, I just got my license like two weeks ago so I could play with this stuff. So you can now use, uh, you know, 2300 to 2310, 2390, 2450 for your access point. I mean, you don't even need encryption at that point. Who's looking? <laughs> Certainly not me. Uh, fixed satellite, point-to-point -point instructional TV, fixed satellite, radio astronomy, Department of Defense. Um, this is why you will get in trouble, folks. Um, I'm releasing this patch. I'm giving it to you as soon as I get it off my laptop, honestly. Um, the problem is, is I've disabled transmit. You can monitor everything you want in this country. It's perfectly legal. If you transmit on a satellite frequency, the feds will be on your doorstep in about 15 minutes. If you transmit on a DOD frequency, they won't bother knocking. Okay? <laughs> So let's look at some of the higher frequencies. Hmm, a little more DOD, public safety. Radio astronomy, radio location, which means radar. 
um, <laughs> ground-based radar. More amateur frequencies. Yes, that's right. We can run new access points now. And more satellite. Again, if you choose to modify my patch and start transmitting, I would really appreciate it if you talked to me. If you have an amateur radio license, I'd be happy to make sure you stay within your proper limits. If you happen to transmit a satellite frequency, I apologize to your next of kin. Okay? Spectrum Analyzer. Um, I did go upstairs and test all this with the Spectrum Analyzer. And I was on my way upstairs to take pictures of the Spectrum Analyzer when the real-time clock on my laptop failed and it shut down and wouldn't boot back up. So as you might have noticed, I was a little late to my own talk, um, and they wouldn't let me borrow the Spectrum Analyzer to show you. So if you guys really want to see this, we'll just all crowd the hardware village upstairs. I'd be happy to show you how it works. Um, again, I've already lost at least one Wi-Fi card and probably severely damaged the second one. Thanks, Michael, by the way. I really appreciate it. Um, these settings may differ from card to card, so if you were to fix it to transmit again, I take no responsibility for you blowing up your card. Just so you know. Okay? Limitations. When adding in all these new channels, there's a lot of problems. Um, most of these license frequencies, especially in the 900 megahertz, but some of the public safety gear as well, they just kind of fudge things. So let's say you have mad Wi-Fi and you have a licensed radio and you say, I want to be on channel one. Well, for the licensed radio, it's going to say channel one, but it's going to set the frequency of 4920. So if you were to use AeroDump or Kismet today, it would set the right frequency and it would pick that up, but all you'd see is that it's on channel one. Not very helpful. It's just done to make things easier so you don't actually have to, to modify things that are visible to the user so that they can keep these things hidden from you. Obviously, it breaks a lot of things. So AeroDump NG, we modified to support all the frequencies. Only the channels are shown in the display right now, and you kind of lose some of the really important header information. Um, yeah, we'll probably fix that. Uh, Kismet can't set the channels at all. It displays channels, not, frequent, uh, not frequencies. But it does save very usable PCAP files, which is nice to go back and read in Wireshark. So a lot of the improvements needed for this, sniffers are too trusting. They see a beacon packet says, I'm on channel 6. They log a access point on channel 6. doesn't matter if channel 6 is you know, 2.6 gigahertz. It's just, I'm on channel 6. It was never really intended to deal with this broken stuff like channel number fudging. Thank you to all the manufacturers that decided that was the best way to do it. Uh, so they really need to be improved. But wait, <laughs> after I submitted this talk, uh, I finally convinced Dragorn that uh, it actually really was setting these channels. So he fixed new core in about two minutes after arguing with me for six months and uh, fixed everything. So now Kismet not only reports the frequencies the packets are received on, it automatically calculates what the center frequency is and shows that to you as well. Uh, the AeroDump NG updates are being made right now, and we should be releasing that with 1.0, and it should work very nicely. Not that the DoD would run web. <coughs> I left my white hat in the speaker room, honestly. Um, Please, please, please. It is legal in this country to monitor whatever you want. If you transmit on these frequencies, you will go to jail. I promise. If you have a license and you want to transmit on some of this stuff, I'd be happy to help you. If you don't have a license, I really recommend leaving the patch as it is. Okay? Have fun, everybody. Enjoy. And uh, we will be taking questions after this. So uh, I've been working on web clocking. I think uh, you still remember the talk of last year. The emperor has no clock. Okay. Um, basically, web is still used, uh, and some companies still use it for like uh, wireless barcode readers, uh, wireless payments. Um, it works by inserting chaff in the air. Uh, it's a good idea, but unfortunately, uh, it y you only have half the bandwidth you, you have. So on a 11 megabit network, 
instead of having 700 kilobyte per second or six, 600, you only have 300. And even sometimes uh, I, you don't even need to filter out clock packets. Uh, Craig and G just find the key directly. You just give the file and then boom, you get the key. How to break it? Uh, there's no public documentation about it, so I had to analyze capture files. Um, what I noticed is that every data packet is cloaked. For every packet, you have a cloaked packet. And at least uh, the packet from the access point are protected. I still have to check for the clients. Management frames and control frames are not cloaked. Uh, also notice that the packet size of the cloaked packet are the same as the original packet. So you can easily find and match the packets on the network. Uh, in many plays with sequence numbers, uh, in most cases it's a bit different than uh, the sequence number of a real packet. For example, if you have a real packet of with a sequence number of five, it can be uh, three or four or six or seven, and maybe a little bit more, but not more than that. Um, and as I said, uh, only data packets are cloaked, meaning that only packets of type two and subtype zero are cloaked. Uh, you can also uh, find what are the cloaked packets by checking the signal. You can see that the signal is different that, than the access point, and that's this way why I did it. So here is a capture file. You can find the sequence, the sequence number of 3669, and you can see uh, a bit upper around there uh, that there is another data packet that has the same uh, sequence number and a, a bit lower here, uh, another data packet that's that same sequence number. So we know that uh, management frames are not cloaked. So we can say that this beacon has a real sequence number and to those two data packets are cloaked. Uh, with the implementation of a tool, uh, we have no idea of uh, what's the real implementation of web cloaking. And since we don't care about uh, the key used by the sensor or if the data used in the packet are real or not, uh, so the idea was using filters to remove cloaked packets. Uh, we have a currently a signal filter that gets the average uh, signal and then can filter out the cloaked packet. We also have a few filters for uh, sequence numbers. Um, we can all, we base our analysis for each filter on packets that are known not to be cloaked. And you can combine filters in a, in a different order. So as I say, we know that uh, all management frames, like control frames, are not cloaked. Uh, we first have a base filter that is always applied. I just explained on the capture file, uh, if any packet with an unknown status, like a data packet that we don't know if it is cloaked or not, uh, if this data packet has the same sequence number as a beacon, for example, or any other management frames, then it's a cloaked packet. We can filter it, filter out. And the other filter we have is a signal filter. Uh, we get the average signal of all packets we know that are not cloaked. Uh, we allow a small margin of error, uh, really small, and packets outside of this margin are cloaked. They should be cloaked. Uh, here's a few numbers. Uh, here's a 
unfiltered capture file that contains both cloaked and uncloaked packets. You can see that there is uh, 400,000 packets, web data packets, and only 200,000 were decrypted successfully, meaning that the rest is cloaked packets. So you can see that half of these packets were cloaked. Uh, in the filtered capture file, you can see that uh, with our filters, we filter a lot of packets. We only have uh, 50,000 cloaked packets left, but that's enough to crack it. Um, and on the cloaked capture file, we can check that to make sure that um, all filters are correct. You can see that on th there is uh, more than 100,000 packets cloaked that we found, and only um, 2,000 are decrypted successfully with the key of the access point, meaning that we th this filter, the signal filter, it's not perfect, but it's already really good, and the it doesn't give a lot of errors. So here is the uh, ACRNG on the file on the filter file. It just decrypt successfully a key, and you can see that it doesn't. Not all packets can be decrypted with that key. So there is a few cloaked packets left. Uh, there will be a release soon, so stay tuned and uh, check our subversion of an. So So uh, as security researchers, I kind of feel it's our duty to the world to assume that we are probably not the smartest people in the world. As such, when I find something new or the aircraft team finds something new or Thomas individually finds something new, we always want to share it because since we're not the smartest people in the world, Somebody else thought about it first. They just weren't polite enough to tell you. There's a lot of things in this talk that are uh, probably vulnerabilities you didn't know about, or that or when you patch your driver, you'll find some vulnerabilities you didn't know about. Um, use this for good. We all want to do things that are fun. We all want to tell people about everything, and we all like our jobs. So just to make sure we've got the uh, lawyer lottery set up, uh, FCC guys, it's me. And um, Thomas writes air crack. I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> so um, anybody from the DOD, uh, stop in. We'll be hanging out in the Q&A and the Wireless Village. And I'd, I'd really love to know how you guys are using this in practice because I see you guys have a lot of frequency space reserved. Um, we have the updated slide presentation on this laptop. That time I reserved to upload it kind of went out the window as I took four laptops apart in the speaker room. We will have a full bibliography posted. It will be posted later this weekend. I'll give you links to all the fun stuff. I will show you all the patches, and I will tell you all the mitigations for what we found. Um, with that in mind, I think we actually have like a few minutes for questions, and then we'll carry on to the speaker room. If you could please use the microphones if you have a question. I think there's a mic somewhere around here. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the question is, can you apply WPA Enterprise to a rainbow table attack? Uh, rainbow tables are actually only used for pre-shared key because Enterprises, you're really attacking the EAP exchange, not the encryption itself, not the passphrase. There isn't really one. So with an enterprise approach, basically what you do, uh, and, and Josh Wright and Brad, I sorry, I can't remember your last name, did a really great presentation on this at Shmoo. It is available for download, but basically they put up a, a fake access point, and then they have a rogue radius server behind it that just pretty much dumps your username and password to a file. So we've we've almost got that in Airbase NG. It should be released fairly shortly here.
Um, the, the, the patch, the, the question is, is the patches for the drivers, is that available for AF 9K? I can't code to save my life, so no, it's not, because I was working on AF 5K for the past few days without sleep, but tomorrow is a new day, and I was going to go out and do that for AF 9K as well. Channel bandwidth support is not in that driver yet for AF 5K. For AF 9K, I believe it supports 20 and 40, and yeah, I don't plan to remove that. But I didn't, I didn't patch in the, uh, the half and quarter rate channels yet. That's number three on my to-do list, actually. Absolutely. Uh, actually, my real-time clock was fried by Michael. I blame Michael Dell. Uh, <laughs> No, I actually had loaded the real-time clock driver because it wasn't loading itself, and I noticed a whole lot of really great interrupt errors. So I don't think that uh, I don't think that the I don't think the clock was fried by the Wi-Fi. However, yeah, some of the outside frequencies did have a little bit of a harmonic, and like I said, I got the card up to 6.0 gigahertz, and it was looking good, and I got it up to 6.1. And uh, all of a sudden, it wasn't transmitting anymore. So we took it back to uh, to another laptop, and we tested it out, and it, it the preamplifier blew. You, you've taken your card out, and there's like the whole thing's hot. Yeah, it was about the tip of my pinky size was hot. The rest of the card was ice cold because just the preamplifier exploded. It was really cool. Another question? So the question is, can, can you use like a, an embedded box to allow for the extra range? The, the problem actually is only the fact that the driver's immature. Uh, AF5K supports station mode, and it supports um, monitor mode. It does support injection, although I disabled that. Um, it doesn't do access point mode. It doesn't even do ad hoc mode properly in my testing. So as soon as that driver matures a little bit, I would definitely be using a 5.925 gigahertz access point as I am authorized by the FCC to do. Uh, question is to modify the card to use more bandwidth. There is definitely a limit in there. Um, I know that Mad Wi-Fi can handle up to 40 with no problem at all. I've not tried to push it farther. The problem is, is that does not work as you'd expect unless your purpose is to jam the frequency. If you enable more bandwidth, you can't monitor more because even if you're on a 40 megahertz wide channel on channel 6, you won't see the 20 megahertz or the 10 or the 5 traffic. You're monitoring the whole thing so your hopping algorithm is different so you don't get the... Uh, you don't get the dynamic spread spectrum properly. So the, the question is, how does the Athros driver play with the new Athros N cards? That's actually a really great question. Ath5K was a project by the BSD team for quite some time, and it works very well for the uh, ABG cards. Athros just released Ath9K maybe a little bit better than a week ago, so that... Theoretically, I hear it works really well, but I've kind of had my head stuck into AF5K for a while. So I'll let you know tomorrow if you're curious. So the highest... Uh, I, I artificially limited the card based on what the Spectrum Analyzer told me. The card will accept being supported to uh, 1.002 gigahertz and then the top end was 6.995 gigahertz. Can it really receive on those frequencies? That's a really great question. I didn't have anything to transmit on those frequencies. I transmitted on a frequency or two, and the card exploded, so I really couldn't get many packets through for sure. Um, as for the antennas, if you use an antenna, that, if you use a, a Wi-Fi card with a built-in antenna, it is definitely not tuned for that. It will feed back from the antenna, and it will blow your preamp. I mean, I'm assuming. Um, however, they make a lot of good cards that have antenna connectors, and you can always build your own cable and connect it to the proper kind of antenna. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I just don't have the equipment to do it. Maybe you can really set 6.995 gigahertz if you have the right antenna. 
I'm willing to bet the card will explode, but I've already tested it with one of mine. You let me know how it works out. <laughs> Any question? No? <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? All right, so we will be hanging out up in um, the Wi-Fi village, and that is right next door to the hardware hacking village. As soon as I can get the patch ripped off of my own laptop, I'd be happy to show people how it works, and it will be posted to Aircrack's website as soon as physically possible. And again, if you're DOD, you know where to find me. I would really love to know what you're using those frequencies for. <laughs>